Baptist Church. Thanks for tuning in and joining me for another week of virtual church. And as we do each week, we gather together to exalt our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And today is Communion Sunday. Uh, so get some elements together because following my message this morning, we're going to be gathering around the Lord's table. Uh, but before we do, we want to exalt Christ by looking to him in his word. So if you have a copy of God's word, and I hope you do, uh, now is the time to uh, pick it up and open it up with me to Acts chapter 4. And as you're finding Acts 4 in your Bibles, let me welcome you to Lesson 3 in our brand new teaching series on the church for us as a church that I've entitled Building on the Rock. Uh, Building on the Rock. As a church, uh, we're hoping to build some new ministries and programs this year, but, but it's so important that we do on the right foundation not on styles or traditions, not on the latest fads or, or trendy innovations, but we must build on the rock, the rock that is Jesus Christ, the one true gospel, and the truth of his word. Because the truth is, everything else is just sinking sand. And thankfully, as a church, we, we don't need to draw up our own building plans or ministry models because Jesus has given us a very specific blueprint to follow. A blueprint, five building blocks for constructing a strong and sacred church that pleases him. And last week, we got to work. As a church, we began construction by looking at building block number one in Jesus' blueprint. And if you remember, it was this, Jesus is Lord. And last week, we tackled the question, why? Why is Jesus and only Jesus Lord? And this morning, we, we want to answer the question, how? How? As a church, how do we build on the rock with this block, right? I mean, what does it look like to be devoted to the Lord as a church? Well, the truth is, it should be obvious. As believers, if we are devoting ourselves both individually and congregationally to Jesus being our Lord, to him being our head, it, it will show in our lives and in the life of our church. It should be obvious for all to see. This reminds me of the song, Let Them See You. Have you ever heard that song? It, it's a wonderful song, and listen to these lyrics. Who am I without your grace? Just another smile, another face. Just another breath, a grain of sand. Passing quickly through your hand. Lord, I give you my life as an offering. Take it all, take everything. Now here's the chorus. Let them see you in me. Let them hear you when I speak. Let them feel you when I sing. Let them see you in how I live. Just let them see you in me. You see, that's the heart of every believer who desires to follow Jesus Christ as Lord. Just, just Jesus, let them see you. Less of me and, and more of you. As John says, I must decrease. Christ must increase. And that's exactly the heart of every believer in the first church right here in our passage of Acts chapter 4. In the final verses of this chapter, Luke it presents us with a photo album of the first church. He gives us snapshots of the life in the, in the Jerusalem church. Photographs of how these early believers followed and honored Jesus as Lord. How it showed. And from this collage of photos, we find three ways that we can show that Jesus is our Lord as a church. Three ways we can honor Christ and show Christ as Lord. And here's the first way. We show Jesus is Lord by our unity. Unity. That, that, that word unity means undivided, whole. It means to be one. Like the three musketeers, one for all and all for what? For one. That's unity. 
And that's exactly what Jesus wants for his church. Jesus gave his life to provide it, and he wants us to keep it. Matter of fact, in John chapter 17, just hours before Jesus is to go to the cross, Jesus prays that his church would be one. And his prayer for unity was answered because the first church was unified. And as a result, Jesus was glorified in the church and he was magnified as Lord and Savior to those outside of the church. I mean, this unified church stood out like a sore thumb to a divided world. And notice their bond of unity in this photo album, beginning in verse 32. Luke says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul. Now understand, at this point in time, the church had grown from a family of 3,000 to over 5,000. I mean, you thought the Duggars and their 19 kids and counting were a big family. They got nothing on this church family. They were 5,000 siblings and counting. And I don't know about your family, but I know my family of four don't always live in harmony. I couldn't imagine a family of 5,000. Yet all 5,000 were of one heart and of one soul. There was harmony, and Jesus provided it, and they kept it. Well, how? Well, the rest of verse 32 tells us. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. Now, here it is. But they had everything in what? What's the word? What does it say? Common. Common. Let me ask you, was every member of this congregation the same? Right? Did all 5,000 people have all things in common? No. The, the, the truth is, they were all different. They all came from different backgrounds and walks of life. Some were Jews, other were Gentiles. Some were rich, most were poor. Some were old, some were young. Some came from religious backgrounds, others non-religious. They were different in color, culture, and race. They all had different ages, styles, preferences, and tastes. And yet, despite all of the diversity, there was this bond of unity. Well, how? Well, it's because they didn't focus on their disparities, but on their similarities. And as a result, there were no discrepancies, but only harmony. There was, there was no young adult ministry or senior saint ministry. There was no youth group or children's church. It was just the church. And they had all things in common. And they kept the unity Jesus provided by focusing on what they had in common. Not on the differences, but on their similarities. And what does every believer have in common with one another? Well, first and foremost, we, we all have the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. We follow him. We, we, we have the same rule book. We, we, we follow the same authority, the scriptures. We do what it says. We have the same power source for life and godliness, the Holy Spirit. He indwells us all and empowers us all to live a godly life. We are all called to the same mission, to reach the world with the gospel, to make more and more disciples in all nations. We have the same hope, eternal life in heaven, because all of our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we are to have the same mind, the mind of Christ. And what is that mindset? Well, it's this, you before me. Christ first other second, me last. That's the mindset. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. 
You see, the first church were, were able to be of one heart and of one soul because they all were of one mind. They all had the mind of Christ. I'm, I'm not here to be served, but to serve. Now, this, this selfless mindset goes completely against the grain of our culture, doesn't it? I mean, it's the complete opposite of all the philosophies of our world. For example, the Greeks said, uh, the Greeks say, be wise and know yourself. The Romans said, be strong and discipline yourself. Religion says, be good and conform yourself. Hedonism says, be sensuous, enjoy yourself. Education says, be resourceful, expand yourself. Psychology says, be confident, assert yourself. Materialism says, be satisfied, please yourself. Pride says, be superior, promote yourself. Humanism says, be capable, believe in yourself. Legalism says, be pious, limit yourself. Philanthropy says, be generous, release yourself. Yourself, yourself, yourself. We are all swimming in a sea of self. Know yourself, love yourself, help yourself, please yourself. We live in a me first generation where it's all about me, 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 me. I mean, how different from the model, message, and mind of Jesus. Jesus says, be a servant, give to others. Be, be selfless, put others first. Be humble, not proud. You see, the mind of Christ is one of humility. Now understand, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not a lack of self-esteem. It's esteeming others more than yourself. That's humility. And without humility, there will be no unity in the body. You see, unity and, and humility are tied together. One breeds the other. Neither can exist without the other. They're like Siamese twins perpetually connected. Matter of fact, if, if you're taking notes, jot this down. The currency of unity is humility. The currency, the, the, the price that, that we as a body must pay for unity is humility. And let me ask you, what, what's the opposite of humility? A pride. So if humility is the currency for unity, then pride is the enemy of unity. Humility breeds harmony, while pride breeds only disharmony. You see, the truth is, when pride wins out, that's when harmony in a church fades out. And trust me, it fades fast. It's like James says, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have... So you murder, you covet, and cannot obtain. So you fight, and you quarrel. Have you ever heard the phrase, where there's smoke, there's fire? Well, well, when it comes to discord in a church, the smoke are the fights and the quarrels. But the fire is a prideful heart. You see, the, the smoke, the discord, comes from prideful hearts. Pride is the enemy of unity. Trust me, it only breeds disharmony. And if we want to be like the first church, one heart, one soul, then we all have to have the same mind, the mind of Christ, you before me. You see, we have to humble ourselves, and we have to die to ourselves. And listen, because Jesus died to bring us unity, the least we can do is die to ourselves to keep it. So let me ask you, are you? Are you? Do, do you have this mind of Christ? Do you put others first or do you always come first? Do you make everything about you? Why doesn't Pastor Tim preach on what I need? Why, why doesn't the praise team pick songs that I like? Why doesn't anyone say hello to me? Me, 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 I, I, I. 
And trust me, if, if that's our mindset, if we are a church full of me monsters, then we'll never be one. And we will for sure be one terrible witness for Christ because Jesus says the outside world will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. This reminds me of the famous orchestra conductor, Leonard Bernstein. One evening, he was performing on television. And during an informal time of discussion on the program, an admirer asked Mr. Bernstein, what is the most difficult instrument to play? He responded by saying this, the second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find one who plays second violin with as much enthusiasm or, or second French horn, or second flute, now that's a problem. And yet, if no one plays second, we have no harmony. Well, those are wise words, and so true for us as a church today. We will never know harmony as long as we are fighting over first fiddle. But when we humble ourselves to second fiddle, we make beautiful harmony that honors our conductor, Jesus Christ, and showcases him as Lord and Savior to the outside world. Three ways we can show that Jesus is Lord as a church. First, by living in unity, and then this. We show Jesus is Lord as a church by giving generously. You see, if you really want to know if Jesus is your Lord then just track your checkbook. Because Jesus says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And a church that truly treasures the Lord keeps a loose grip on earthly treasures. They're generous. Notice this in the first church's photo album, beginning in verse 34. There was not a needy person among them. Now remember, the church had grown to over 5,000 members. That's a lot of people. And with people come needs. That word needy is speaking of financial needs, groceries, clothing, housing. And yet there wasn't one in 5,000 who had a financial need. There wasn't a single needy person. Well, how can that be? I mean, who met their needs? The, the, the Roman government? A, a well-run welfare program? The Goodwill? Salvation Army? A, a local soup kitchen? Who met their needs? Well, look at the rest of verse 34. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had what? need. So who met the needs of the first church? The first church. You see, those who had more than enough, a surplus of property and real estate, sold their surplus and gave all the proceeds to their brothers and sisters in Christ who didn't have enough. And as a result, everyone had enough. There wasn't a single needy person. Now, please understand, what these early believers were doing with their assets goes completely against the advice of any and all financial advisors. I mean, even Dave Ramsey wouldn't agree. Any investor will tell you that you can't build wealth by selling all your investments and giving all the proceeds away. I mean, that, that's like wealth building 101. But these believers weren't following the advice of savvy investors or financial advisors in order to build earthly wealth. They were following the commands of their Lord and Savior Jesus in order to build eternal wealth. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, that we're to give to anyone who asks. In Matthew 6, 2, Jesus says we're to give to the needy and we're to do so without putting on a show. Later in Matthew 6, Jesus says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures here on earth, but we're to store up treasures where? In heaven. So you see, the early church was just simply following the financial advice of Jesus. Don't hoard, give. Don't, don't be a cheapskate, be generous. Don't, don't get caught up in earthly treasures. 
Instead, invest in what really matters, eternity. And how they managed their money showed who truly was managing their lives, Jesus. And it was their generosity, their, their loose grip on their treasures that showed that they treasured Jesus more, that he was more than enough, that Jesus was their Lord. See, the first church was a picture of contentment. Contentment. We don't like that word, especially our world. Contentment is an attitude. It's an attitude of satisfaction and peace. Contentment says enough is enough. I don't need more and more and more. I have enough because I have Christ. That's contentment. And, and, and it was this attitude that, 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 that every member of the church had in common. The wealthy were not greedy. The poor did not envy. Instead, because they had Jesus, enough was enough. Like the Apostle Paul says, they learned to be content in whatever circumstances they found themselves in. You see, contentment is not a trait we're born with. It doesn't just happen. You can't catch contentment like you do a cold. I wish it were that easy. Instead, contentment is something we must learn. Well, how did the first church learn this lesson of contentment? How did they develop this attitude of enough is enough? More importantly, how can we learn the same lesson and be just as generous as a church? Well, can you guess what's coming? That's right, a list. I mean, you should know by now that I love lists. And so here's a list on contentment just for you. Three tips to help us learn to be content. All right, three tips to contentment. Here's the first tip. View your treasures vertically. In other words, remember that every cent in your piggy bank, every asset you possess, every toy you enjoy, every child you love, everything you have is a gift from your heavenly Father above. They don't belong to you. They belong to him. I don't care if you've paid off your house. I don't care if you've purchased that new car with cash. I don't even care if you're just three payments away from paying off that camper. You don't own them. You own nothing. Jesus owns everything. Matter of fact, that's exactly how the first church viewed their treasures. Look at verse 33. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and of one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his what? Own. Own. Well, if they didn't own them, then who did? Jesus did. You see, they were able to keep a loose grip on their wallets because they recognized we don't even own our wallets. And because they viewed their treasures vertically, they gave generously. And if you want to learn to be content, then you need to learn to view your treasures the same way. It's not my house. It's God's. It's not my money. It's Christ's. It's not my stuff. It's the Lord's. Nothing belongs to me. It all belongs to my Lord Jesus Christ. And he blesses me with what is his so that I might be a blessing to others. And when God chooses to give me more than I need, then I'm going to give generously to my brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need. Enough is enough. That's contentment. And it begins when we view our treasures vertically. And it continues to grow when we view our treasures in the light of eternity. That's the second tip. You see, contentment requires a right perspective, an eternal one. And Paul gives us that right perspective when he says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Now here it is. We have brought nothing into this world so we can take nothing or anything out of it either. You see, we gain contentment and lose this desire for more and more and more when we read the eternal dimension into today's situation. When we remember we entered this life empty-handed and we will leave it the same way. Trust me, I've been to a lot of funerals and I have never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul. 
And that's why Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. You see, no earthly treasure lasts forever. And not only that, but, but the most important things in life, no amount of treasure can, can buy. For example, treasure can buy you medicine, but not health. Treasure can buy a house, but not a home. Treasure can buy entertainment, but not happiness. Treasure can buy a bed, but not sleep. Treasure can buy a crucifix, but not a savior. Treasure can buy a good life, but not eternal life. And that's why Jesus says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his own soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? You see, no amount of earthly treasure can make anyone truly rich. Only Jesus can. Four tips to help us be content. Number one, view your treasure view vertically. Number two, view it in light of eternity. And then this, focus on necessity. In other words, we learn to be content when we boil life down to its essentials. Or as Baloo the bear once sang in a jungle book, the simple, bare necessities of life. And, and what are those simple, bare necessities of life? Well, trust me, it's not a new boat or sports car. It's not a jet ski or TV. It is not more jewelry or an ATV. It, it's not name brand clothing or fine dining. Paul says it's, it's food and covering. Food and covering. With these, we will be content. And it was these bare necessities of life that the first church focused on. Look at verse 34 again. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. That word need, it refers to the basic necessities of life. Something to eat, something to wear, a roof over our heads. Everything beyond that, the first church considered extra. And all those who had extra, those who owned land and real estate properties, sold their extra so that everyone could have what they need. You see, they didn't buy into the lie that says you need more and more and more to be truly happy. You see, Satan's plan of attack is to try to create dissatisfaction in us, that Jesus isn't enough. You see, he wants to convince us that we must be in a constant pursuit of something out there that is sure to bring us joy and fulfillment. I mean, think about it. Our world says you need more and more prosperity, more and more material possessions, more and more physical comforts to be truly happy. As Madonna says, I'm a material girl living in a what? A material world. And people are buying into this lie hook, line, and sinker. And as a result, they, they, they forfeit lasting pleasures in Christ for the fleeting pleasures of this world. And Satan's number one weapon in his arsenal to make us discontent are advertisements, right? Advertisers promise that their products will satisfy our deepest needs and inner longings for love, acceptance, security, sexual fulfillment, I mean, the right deodorant, toothpaste, or shampoo will make you irresistible to the opposite sex. The right car, road bike, or outfit will bring you acceptance and respect. A house or bank account will guarantee you security and love. A vacation home, a timeshare, or an expensive camper will bring your family happiness. You need more and more and more. You need the newest, the, the brightest, the, the best. Well, the first church didn't buy into that mess. They knew they were made by and for Jesus to know him, to love him, to enjoy him forever. He was their purpose for existence. He was their Lord and Savior. And they found in him what this world always fails to deliver, infinite joy and eternal pleasures. And it showed by their focus on the essentials. Food and covering is all we need. With these, we will be content. 
four tips to help us learn to be content. View your treasure vertically, view it in light of eternity, focus on the necessities, and then this, look to the cross of Calvary. Jot this down. The cross brings contentment. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. You see, you learn to be content by always looking to the cross. When you remember how you were once spiritually poor, how you were in poverty, up to your eyeballs in debt because of your sin. But Jesus, who was rich beyond belief, I mean, he makes Elon Musk and Bill Gates look like beggars. Jesus is eternal God. He owns everything, yet he willingly gave up everything for us. He left his eternal riches in heaven and lived in poverty on earth. He became a man while remaining fully God, and he did so in order to pay our debt. Jesus, who was sinless, took all of our sin and died our death on a cross so that poor sinners like us could become rich saints in him. You see, we are blessed because he was cursed. We are forgiven because he was forsaken. We have eternal life because he gave up his life. We are rich because he became poor. Jesus gave so we could gain. He gave all so we could gain all. And so when you're struggling to give, remember how much Jesus gave for you, his all. When you're not willing to sacrifice for another, remember how Jesus sacrificed for you. And the truth is, we are never more like Jesus. We are never more like our Heavenly Father than when we give. This reminds me of a story that came from World War II. When the Second World War came to a close, Europe began picking up the pieces. Much of the old country had been ravaged by war and was in ruins. Perhaps the saddest sight of all was that of little orphan children starving in the streets of those war-torn cities. Early one chilly morning, an American soldier was making his way back to the barracks in London. As he turned the corner in his jeep, he spotted a little lad with his nose pressed up against the window of a pastry shop. Inside, the cook was kneading dough for a fresh batch of donuts. The hungry boy stared in silence, watching every move. The soldier pulled his jeep to the curb, stopped, got out, and walked quietly over to where the little fellow was standing. Through the steamed-up window, he could see the mouth-watering morsels as they were being pulled from the oven, piping hot. The boy salivated and released a slight groan as he watched the cook place them under the glass enclosed counter ever so carefully. The soldier's heart went out to this nameless orphan as he stood beside him. Son, would you like some of those? The boy was startled. Oh, yeah, I would. The American stepped inside and bought a dozen, put them in a bag, and walked back to where the lad was standing in the foggy cold of the London morning. He smiled, held up the bag, and simply said, Here you are, kid. As he turned to walk away, he felt a tug on his coat. He looked back and heard the child ask quietly, Mister, are you God? You see, we are never more like God, never more like Jesus than when we give. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. God the Father gave his son, Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, gave his life. And because Jesus gave up everything to make us family, the least we can do is to be willing to give up our extra to meet the needs of our family. So may it be his generosity towards us that motivates us to be generous to others. Three ways we can showcase that Jesus is Lord as a church by living in, un in unity, by giving generously. And then this, we show Jesus is Lord by sharing the gospel with urgency. Notice this in our text, verse 33. 
and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Now notice, the apostles were not going to the lost and telling them that they were Christians. They weren't going and telling others that they go to church. They weren't even going and inviting the lost to church. They were going and giving testimony of what? The resurrection, the gospel. And please understand, it wasn't just the apostles, Peter, James, and John, who, who went sharing the gospel. It was the whole church. Together they were going and sharing with urgency the gospel. To see this, turn back with me to Acts chapter 2. And once you're there in Acts 2, look at, look at the end, verses 46 and 47. Are you there? Uh, follow along as I read. It says, And day by day the church, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Now here it is. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being what? Saved. Let me ask you, how were you saved? How, how did it all go down? What's, what's your story? I may not know your salvation story, but I do know this. Someone went to you and preached to you the gospel, did they not? Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. And how can anyone hear without a what? Without a preacher. So here's all these people coming to faith in Jesus. Every day, souls are being saved and added to the church. Well, how? The church was going and preaching the gospel with urgency. Matter of fact, later in Acts 8, 4, we read that when the Jerusalem church was being scattered because of intense persecution, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Well, why? Why were they going and sharing with such urgency? And more importantly, why must we? Well, two reasons, really. Number one, Jesus commands it. Jesus commands it. Why must we go and preach the gospel? Because Jesus says so, yo. That's why we go. Please understand, this going and preaching the gospel is not optional. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. And, and you can't call Jesus your Lord and then tell him no. And over and over again, Jesus commands us to go. Jesus says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go and make disciples in all nations. In Acts 1, 8, Jesus commands his disciples to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now notice, none of those verses say that Jesus asked his disciples, would you please be willing to go and preach the gospel for me? Is that what those verses said? No. None of those verses say that Jesus suggested to his disciples, you can be my witnesses if you want to, or, or, or if it's convenient for you. Is that what those verses tell us? No. Jesus doesn't ask or suggest. He commands, go, preach. As Christians, we call this the Great Commission. But really, it should be called the Great Commandment because Jesus isn't asking us. He's telling us, go, preach the gospel. But sadly, for, for so many Christians, it's not the Great Commission, but it has become the Great Omission. Matter of fact, a recent evangelism survey conducted by Lifeway Research found that 80% of Christians have never led one person to Jesus. And what's even worse, 50% have never shared Jesus with anyone ever. So listen, if that stat is true, then that means that most of us watching this morning have never led one person to a saving relationship with Jesus. If that stat is true, then that means that more than half of us in this room have never shared Jesus with anyone ever. You see, if that stat is true, then that means most of us sitting in our chairs, watching this video, are doing just that, sitting in chairs, watching videos. And please understand, we're not called to just go to church, sit in chairs, sing songs, and hear a sermon. But we're also called to go 
and share the gospel. And so let me ask you, are you a chair sitter or a gospel bearer? Are you just a Sunday worshiper or are you an ambassador? Well, the first church had no chair sitters, trust me. They were only ambassadors. And as a result, souls were being saved every day. Here's a second reason why we as a church must go and share the gospel with urgency. Souls depend on it. Jesus stresses this in Mark 16 when he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then he says this, He who believes will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Well, condemned to what? Well, to die. Well, well why? Sin. Death is a result of sin. Uh, James says sin brings forth death. And, and here's the problem. We all have sinned. And so that means we all are, we're all condemned to die. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. Romans 6.23 says, for the penalty or the punishment of our sin is death, condemnation. You see, because we have all sinned, we're all condemned to die, both physically and spiritually. Well, what exactly is this spiritual death? Well, it's hell. As Romans 20, 14 says, the lake of fire, hell, is the second death. Well, what is hell like? Well, the scriptures have much to say about hell. Matter of fact, the Bible speaks of hell more than it does heaven. And here's how the Bible describes hell. Matthew 13 describes hell as a constant burning garbage dump filled with worms and a foul odor. Revelation 14 says that hell is a place of constant burning sulfur. Revelation 20 describes hell as a lake of fire. Matthew 8 tells us that hell is a place of total, complete, and outer darkness. Both Isaiah 33 and Matthew 5 say that hell is a place of unspeakable suffering. While Matthew 25 says it's a place of endless suffering. And finally, in 2 Thessalonians 1.9, it speaks of hell as a place of complete and total separation from God and others forever. It's a place of eternal, solitary confinement. That is hell. And this isn't make-believe. This, this isn't some fairy tale. This isn't a myth or some kind of legend. Hell is very real. And it's reserved for all unrepentant sinners. And it's what all unrepentant sinners will justly receive. Listen, the flames of hell are burning at this very moment. And our sin has earned us a reservation. But thankfully, there is hope. You may suffer and die physically. But listen, you don't have to suffer in hell for all of eternity. I mean, that's why Christ came. He came to die, and he died to save his people from their sin and its cursed death. And all who confess their sin and believe in Jesus alone for the forgiveness of their sins and who commit their lives to him will be saved. As Jesus says in verse 16, whoever believes in me will be saved. Saved from what? Sin, death, hell, but Jesus says, whoever does not believe will be condemned. Condemned to what? To die. To die physically and then suffer in hell for eternity. So you see, man's only hope of heaven and their only escape from hell is Jesus. And that's why the first church shared the gospel with urgency. And so must we. Souls are at stake. And the truth is, if you bear the name Christian... If you call yourself a disciple, but you have no desire to share Jesus with anyone, that means two things about you. Either one, you don't believe in hell, or two, you don't care if anyone goes there. Because the truth is, if you truly believed in the horrors of hell, then you wouldn't want anyone to end up there. You wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy Instead, you would go with urgency everywhere to everyone to preach the gospel, which is the power of God, able to save all who believe. Well, today, there are 7.3 billion people in our world. And of those 7.3 billion people, get this, over 1.6 billion have never heard the gospel 
In the last 40 years, over 1 billion people have died without ever hearing about Jesus. And in this year alone, 2021, it's estimated that another 30 million people will perish without ever hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. 56 million people die each year. 153,000 people die each day. 6,390 people die every hour. 107 people die every minute. Two people die each and every second. Before you and I can, can even count to one Mississippi, two more people close their eyes in death. Every second that goes by, another person dies and their soul falls into hell for eternity. And we see it, we know it, but do we care? Do you care? Do I care? All around our church, you read this slogan. We have been banded together to build God's kingdom. It's a great slogan. I like that slogan. It's a true slogan, but is it true of you? Is it true of us as a church? Honestly, are we banding together and building God's kingdom with one another? Are we going and sharing the gospel in our community with urgency? Or is that just a, a, a slogan it's just another Christian cliche. And, and listen, Jesus is not looking for slogans. He doesn't want cliches. He wants committed followers who are making disciples. And most of our neighbors, most of the families and individuals in our community are on the fast track to hell. And we have the hope they need the gospel. So let's band together and build the kingdom by going with urgency and sharing Jesus while we still can. Let's, let's get out there and preach the gospel before it's too late. Let's do it now because later could be never. Jesus is Lord. Amen. He is the head of his church. And what does he desire for his church? Unity, generosity, and urgency. And it's my desire as your pastor that we would all desire the same. That we would all strive to have the mind of Christ, humility. And it would show in unity. That we would all have the heart of Christ, sacrifice. And it would show in our generosity. And that we would all be committed to the mission of Christ, make disciples. And it would show in our urgency. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for our time in the Word. Thank you for these snapshots of the first church. God, that, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a blueprint for us. It shows us what you desire. And so, God, may we not just learn what you desire for us as a church, but may we strive to be what you've called us to be. That we would live in unity, that we would be generous, that we would be bold and going with urgency to share the gospel with the lost around us. And we would do so till you come. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a church, there's no better way for us to confess and celebrate that Jesus is our Lord than with communion. A communion is an ordinance that Jesus has set aside for his church. All those who have been saved from their sin through faith in his name. So if you've put your faith in Jesus alone to save you, if you've turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus, then communion is for you. And by the way, if you have not done that, why not do that today? May today be the day of your salvation. But if you have done that, then I invite you now to fellowship with me around the Lord's table. 
And we gather together around the Lord's table to accomplish two things. First, we, we gather to remember. We, we want to look back at the grace of God in saving us from our sin through the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. As Isaiah 53 tells us, by his wounds we are healed. And we gather to remember those wounds, his wounds, and to give him thanks. And to help us remember, Jesus gave us elements. First, there's the bread. The bread is a symbol of Christ's body that was crucified on a tree so that we could be forgiven. And the second element is the cup, which is a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed as payment for our sin. Now, please understand, these elements in no way can save you from your sin. Only faith in Jesus can. So we don't take these elements to be forgiven, but we take them to remember, to give thanks for what Jesus has done in saving us. So we gather around the Lord's table to remember, but also to repent. We want to examine ourselves. God, search me and know me and see if there be any sinful way in me. And if God, through his spirit, brings to your mind a sin that you've been giving yourself over to, repent of that. Maybe you've been battling pride and an attitude of arrogance. Maybe you've been struggling with discontentment and, 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 and a, a critical spirit. Maybe you've been slacking in your commitment to the gospel mission. If so, confess that to God. So we, we gather now to remember and repent. But before we do, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and give thanks for these incredible elements, the bread and the cup. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for this ordinance. It's such a blessing for us as a church. It, it, it centers us. It, it reminds us that even though we were more sinful than we ever could imagine, we were more loved by you than we ever could believe. So much so that, God, you sent your son Jesus, and he gave up his life, his body on a cross, and he shed his blood as an atoning sacrifice for sin so that we could be forgiven and saved from our sin and its curse, eternal death. God, what, what more can we say but thanks? What more can we do but give our life to Jesus? And so, God, I ask that um, in light uh, of the Lord's table, in light of what Jesus has done for us, may we present ourselves as sacrifices for him. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Well, in the same manner, Jesus also took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. N not if he comes, until he comes. Jesus is coming. Amen? But until that day, we have a job to do. We're to be proclaiming his death, the gospel, till he comes. And because we don't know the day, because we don't know the hour, we must go and proclaim the gospel with urgency. Well, let's close our time in prayer. God, once again, we come before you uh, with a heart of thanksgiving and a heart of gratitude in light of what Jesus has done for us. God, it was all a work of grace. We did not deserve or, 
or, or, or earn our forgiveness or salvation, but God, you, you gave your son, Jesus gave his life so that we might have life in his name. And so we give him the glory. And we ask that we'd bring him glory this week as we strive to live for him, to proclaim him till he comes. I ask this all in Jesus' name.